and welcome to Baha'i On Air. I'm Bev Watson. And I'm Guy Sinclair. Baha'i On Air is brought to you by the Baha'is of New Zealand and throughout this series we'll be featuring segments from Baha'i videos as well as local interviews and news. This program will feature further highlights from the documentary about New Zealand Baha'i artist Robin White. Robin now lives in Kiribati with her family and this documentary provides a colourful and poignant look at her life and work as well as a look at the Baha'i community in that tiny island nation. The Baha'i faith teaches that all humanity is one family and that we are now at the stage in our collective evolution when world peace is not only possible but necessary. Baha'is also believe that one of the major barriers to world peace is the extremes of wealth and poverty which currently exist in so many parts of the world. These extremes are a source of acute suffering for millions and keep the world in a state of instability, continually on the brink of war. What is needed is a new, universal attitude. Believing in the oneness of humanity, that we all part of one collective human family, is an essential and major part of the solution. The vast majority of the people of the world are sinking ever deeper into hunger and wretchedness when wealth on a scale undreamt of in the past is at the disposal of the world's leaders. This video selection is from the documentary Arun Tebeku, a portrait of pioneering about New Zealand Baha'i artist Robin White. It also shows some of the activities of the Baha'is in the Pacific. Enjoy. You are the angels If your feet be firm Be steadfast as a rock Let no Robin White, her husband Mike Furukowski, and their eight-year-old son Michael moved to Kiribati, previously known as the Gilbert Islands. Two more of their children, Conrad and Florence, were born there. Several years after the family established their home in this Pacific Island nation of Kiribati, they were visited by a longtime family friend. Anthony Vojkovic. Obviously, these are especially for uh, for Conrad yeah. and Florence. Yeah. Yeah. Ernest yeah. Adams, a very fine so New Zealand company. Kind of animal. The pandas and the smiling faces. Look at this. You you came the day I arrived, it was very, very beautiful. You know, sort of the full sunny day, middle of the morning. It was just such a beautiful looking place. But I was appalled at how little land there was between the ocean and lagoon. There's nowhere on this island where you couldn't hit a golf ball from the lagoon side to the ocean side mm. if the trees weren't there. I mean, it's that narrow. In his holy revelation, Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, encouraged the Baha'is to leave their homes and move near or far with the intention of serving his cause. Robin White is one of New Zealand's leading contemporary painters. Since living in an extremely different environment, her subjects have changed. <laughs> 
Paula says, the world of humanity is like a garden. All the races are the flowers, which constitute its adornment and decoration. It's a paradox. Human beings from such different cultural and racial and religious backgrounds can have so much in common. You know, the basic urges and drives, and the need for love, the need for acceptance, you know, is there in any human being. And at the same time that we can be so profoundly different. I find that very interesting. <laughs> Obviously, the need is for us to understand and certainly accept the profound similarities that we have and at the same time to respect and understand our differences and to celebrate those differences really. If you haven't experienced that degree of difference it can be very unsettling, disorienting at first and you wonder where am I? What are these people thinking? What are they doing? You know, why are they doing this? qualities which I really admire about the Kiribati people, both men and women, perhaps especially the women, is their stoicism, you know, their, their acceptance of, of circumstances they find themselves in. There. They don't, they're not a complaining people. A good example of that would be my friend Nidasi. When she was very little she had polio. That has left her with a speech impediment with um, one arm and hand. She cannot use it all, has no feeling. With legs that have no feeling and uh, she cannot stand up, she sits all day long. And she is consistently cheerful. Consistently cheerful. And she has a radiance uh, about her which is catching. I, I like very much love to be in her company. And she is a staunch Baha'i. She fasts. Every year she keeps the fast. The Baha'i faith recognizes the importance of the maintenance of traditional cultures. At the same time, it offers new spiritual principles to protect humanity from materialism, disunity, substance abuse, and other excesses of the modern age. This country was never swamped with Western influence. It's creeping in gradually as it is all around the world, you know, the video, the effect of videos and so on. This place was very much isolated by its geographical location and the fact that the British administration kept it sort of as a, almost an isolationist policy, didn't develop routes of communication to the country. And so this country has retained its cultural identity very, very strongly. is to keep the rest of the body really still so your, your shoulders shouldn't be going up and down and your arms should be very still. It's 
it's very difficult to do. It takes enormous discipline to get it. And your every mo the movement should be crisp. Like your eyes, everything, every part of your body has a position to be in. Your eyes, the movement of your head from one side to another, the, the direction in which you're looking is all prescribed. You know. very um, proud of their culture and, and see it as, their, as a great resource. Here are some basic facts about the Baha'i faith. Baha'is believe there are many names for God, but there is only one God, neither male nor female, nor a physical being. God created us through the process of evolution and gave us spiritual qualities and the power to know and understand. Baha'is believe that God has sent prophets to all the peoples of the earth who are animated by the same Holy Spirit. They all reveal the Word of God and teach the same faith. Race unity is the belief that we are all children of God and that we can love each other as one family. The central purpose of the Baha'i faith is to establish the unity of the human race. The Baha'i community is more than 150 years old and has more than 5 million believers in 300 nations. The Baha'i faith has been established in countries throughout the world as an independent religion based on Holy Scripture. The issue of culture is highly charged and complicated to foreigners, or imatong, as they are called in Kilpatis. It seems to me that there are certain things that, well, that are, are fairly clear that pertain to all cultures. And in this I include Western culture. You come across a lot of Pākehā, imatangs, who say, oh, well, I, I culture doesn't bother me, I don't have a culture. But then you ask them to sit, sit on, a, on the mat on the floor, suddenly that's impossible. They've got to have a chair to sit on. You ask them to eat off a plate with their fingers, they can't do it, they've got to have a fork and a knife. That's the culture. Nothing stays the same. That the change of some form is absolutely inevitable and it has affected every culture and it's, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, one of the things that um, sometimes I get challenged on back in New Zealand, I go back to New Zealand and people say, how dare you <laughs> uh, interfere with another people's culture? But who are the people creating this change? Not me. It's women like Naomi and the members of her committee, and they want that change. Tell me one Kiribati woman who doesn't want things to change. If we don't take this seriously and examine the nature of change and what we're going to change to, then the change will be extremely negative, and we've seen this already here. I, in the 12 years that I've been here, there's been extraordinary change already and a lot of it very, very troubling. It's changing already radically and in a very negative way what are traditional concepts of modesty, of behaviour, um, relationships, long held um, attitudes regarding the proper relationships between men and women. Um, concepts of morality, which, which are cultural, which are traditional in Kiribati, are just it's falling apart. Alcoholism, the abuse of alcohol is, is considered to be a huge problem now in Kiribati. It is a, it's a huge factor in relation to the uh, death toll on the roads, on uh, health, um, family life. It's a big problem. What's the answer? And finally, an 11-year-old boy, Daburume Nakao, is reported to have committed suicide on Sunday at Nono's Island. Daburume's body was found hanging at his father's home. 
His parents did not indicate the reason why he hanged himself. Assistant Superintendent of Police, Mr. Ari Teretautua, says Sapurime is the youngest victim so far. And that turns the news bulletin from Radio Kiribati. Mike does the shopping pretty well most of the time. It depends what you want. If it, basic things, you know, the very basic things like your tea, your rice, your flour, your sugar, that can be got from the little shop that's just diagonally over the road from us. Otherwise, we pretty much live on um, rice and fish and variations on that particular theme. 101 ways with fish. Tuna fish, fresh tuna fish can masquerade as just about anything. <laughs> Am I eating lamb or fish or chicken or beef? You know? It's an amazing fish to eat and uh, that's what we eat a lot of here. We, we cook the scraps of the cats. If they cook, they'd last longer in the fridge. They're very bony. Do it right, there's no bones anywhere, anywhere to be seen. And last night we had some, almost like smoked. When I came here, um, I was terribly homesick for New Zealand. More so than Mike. Mike, Mike is different from me and has a different feeling for, for New Zealand and the land and so on. I, I miss the hills desperately, and the, the land. And well, you know, you miss your friends and you miss your family, but I also miss the place desperately. And I'd have dreams about hills. This was an actual dream I had. I went to an outer island in Kiribati. And I found there a New Zealander who was living there, who had a track there, and who had made a hill. <laughs> Scraped all the sand together and made a hill and planted grass on it, and here was this green hill. Green mound. <laughs> and I, I thought, how well, wonderful, I found a hill. I woke up, of course, it was a loony, a totally loony dream. One way pioneering has affected Ropin's art has been a change in media from an emphasis on painting to working mostly with woodcut prints. Through her father, Ropin is of New Zealand Māori ancestry. In Māori society, a prominent place is held by the whakairo, the master carvers. This uh, beautiful work that they produced out of wood <laughs> and I just felt at home with it. It was not a problem and uh, I loved that sense of cutting into the wood and creating images. Her art has provided a strategy for learning more about this unique culture by creating a special woodcut series. I felt uh, quite satisfied with those images which the Beginner's Guide to Gilbert Tees, which were all about arriving here and learning the language. And you, you see in those images, you see things which were familiar, which were becoming familiar. The maniaba and the canoe and the, the baria. These were all things around us. I was getting to know and I was putting names to them. And in a sense, I saw myself as among other things, is going back to that medieval tradition of woodcut prints as um, being associated with a process of education. And uh, it seemed like the appropriate way to say what I wanted to say at that particular time. There is a, an element of isolation involved in working here as an artist. But at the same time, you can't talk about this place as being a place in which I am isolated in terms of the, the human equation. <laughs> because this society here is a very gregarious society, unlike New Zealand, where you can be isolated in your little house on your little street, and days can go by where you don't talk to anybody, or you, know, you travel on a bus and nobody's talking. The first question we were asked was, you know, what is your name? Where are you from? What is your father's name? What is your religion? <laughs> and it was quite typical to be asked these four questions early on. They wanted to know, you know your name, obviously. 
where you were from, but to be asked your religion was mm. a real a, a novelty for us, because nobody in New Zealand inquires what is your religion. It's like I mean, it's just a taboo subject. It's the last thing you want to, to talk about in New Zealand culture, and that's quite different here. It's, what you believe is the, is the most interesting thing about a person here, and that's why, and that's why it's discussed. So I found out that a woman who was travelling New Zealand giving talks in towns and religious cities throughout New Zealand was going to be visiting their area and was going to be giving a talk about the Baha'i faith. So they decided to go and they went and listened to what she had to say and were very attracted by the Baha'i principles of unity and concepts of peace and the oneness of mankind. And so they asked questions and they investigated, they read books, and in 1948 they both became Baha'is. Now my father was the first Baha'i of Māori ancestry. Kiribati was occupied during World War II by the Japanese. The U.S. Marines invaded in 1943 for the Battle of Tarawa and defeated the Japanese in one of the bloodiest battles of the war. In addition to large losses on both sides, thousands of local people died and suffered greatly. Remnants of the war still haunt the island. This is where the Japanese ran to after the battle on Tarawa. This is where they, they came to and they finally flushed out and, and the last of them were killed by the Americans. And their bodies, the people here said, I said how many, and they said many, many Japanese. Their bodies and all their, their uniforms and their guns and everything, all buried here. So this um, preoccupation with the paramount importance of, of promoting peace pervaded my childhood. You know. The discussion around the dinner table was always the world situation and what was happening in the world and what was likely to happen and how important it was for certain things to be done and, and so on. So I, I grew up with these ideas, you know. And there's still a, a preoccupation with my work. This is the, this is the, the day that has been planned for the youth conference. So we, so we give our thanks to all of you who have come to, to uh, attend this conference. Baha'u'llah's message of peace and spiritual well-being are sorely needed in a struggling world. Robin and Mike's love for God and love for humanity assist them in their efforts to bring about a united world through serving their beloved Baha'i community in the midmost heart of the ocean. <laughs> This family sends a message of love and encouragement to the thousands of Baha'i pioneers throughout the world. It is the efforts of pioneers, both past and present, that has made the Baha'i faith the second most widespread religion on the planet, promoting the cherished ideals of the oneness of God, the oneness of religion, and the oneness of people.
try.